Tonight we'll be in the 23rd chapter of Genesis. As you know, this is, a, this is an overview of Genesis. We're not going into a lot of details on it. It's not that kind of book. We're going to read the record of Sarah's death and burial. Now, if you think that's not very important, just imagine if your death and burial was in the Bible. Boy, that'd be something, wouldn't it? You just tell people in the genealogies, they don't like reading the genealogies, and I say, well, what if your name was in there? Oh, yeah, then you'd be reading them genealogies every day. Now you want to remember as we go through here that God mentions people in the scripture that has to do with his purpose and clarifies what he's doing. And there's never anyone mentioned in the Bible that the world counted famous unless that person was connected with what God is doing, like Nebuchadnezzar or Pharaoh or something like that. But I, I, I think I supplied you with a list some time ago of all the famous people that were born during the time the Bible was written. Medicine, mathematicians, astronomers, you know, people that actually their teaching is the groundwork of modern day medicine. So they're not mentioned in the Bible at all. And the reason is because there's nothing in them that clarifies God, Christ, or his purpose. But these people we're reading about, they're tailored people. God has tailored the text. So all you know about these people is what he wants you to know. And I'm going to read the text here. Genesis 23. Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. These were the years of Sarah's, of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kerjath Arba. The name is Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And, Ab <clears throat> and Abraham stood up before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying unto him, Hear us, my lord, thou art a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulchres bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulchre, but that thou mayest bury thy dead. And Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, even to the children of Heth. And he communed with them, saying, If it be in your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he hath, which is in the end of his field, for as much money as it is worth. He shall give it me for a possession of a burying place amongst you. And Ephron dwelt among the children of Heth, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abram, Abraham in the audience of the children of Heth, even of all that went in the gate of the city, saying, Nay, my lord, hear me. The field give I thee, and the cave that is therein I give it thee. In the presence of the sons of my people give I it thee. Bury thy dead. And Abraham bowed him down himself before the people of the land, and he said unto Ephron in the audience of the people of the land, saying, But if thou wilt give it, I pray thee, hear me. I will give thee money for the field. Take it from me, and I will bury my dead there. And Ephron answered Abraham, saying, My Lord, hearken unto me. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. And what is that betwixt me and thee? Bury therefore thy dead. And Abram hearkened unto Ephron, and Abram weighed to Ephron the silver, which he had named in the audience of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, current money with the merchant. And the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, 
which was before Mamre, the field and the cave, which is therein, and all the trees that were in the field that were in all the borders round about it were made sure unto Abraham for a possession in the presence of the children of Heth before all that went in at the gate of his city. And after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And the field and the cave that is therein are made sure unto Abraham for a possession of a burying place by the sons of Heth. All right, we're going to learn quite a bit here. Uh, tonight. Now we're learning a lot about Abraham. That's all tailored. As I say, it's all tailored. God is telling you what he wants you to see in Abraham because he has raised Abraham up as a living demonstration of faith. Yes, amen. Abraham is the father of all them that believe. That's what the scripture says. Romans 4.16. So if a person's faith's not like Abraham's faith, it's not real. Amen. It's bogus. You will notice Abraham always obeyed God. He never backed up, never flinched, never said why, never balked. If God said leave, he left. Whatever God told him to do, he left. And if he made what you think are mistakes, it was only because he didn't know what you know. As soon as, he, as soon as he had further revelation, he'd shape his life by that revelation. It's a marvelous, a marvelous consistency in the whole thing. In this way, God didn't have to update the record or have a later revision, <laughs> anything like that. Because he accented what he wanted people to see. He called Abraham. He's the one that said he's the father of all of them that believe. You're the children of Abraham. You didn't believe that you're the children of Abraham. So you're the seed of Abraham. So now he's going to, Abraham's going to live faith out. From the record of the calling of Abraham on, his life revolved around what God said. We don't know anything about Abraham his first 70 or 75 years. We just know who his father was and his brothers as sent. We don't know anything else about him. But from the, from the call on, well, the rest of the Bible is about Abraham and his seed. From Genesis 12.1 to Revelation 22.17 is an elaboration of Abraham and his seed, capital S, which is Christ. Amen. rest of the Bible is about it. So this is, a, this is the key figure. So if you're going to find fault with somebody, you don't want to be Abraham. Because God never said a bad word about Abraham. God, I've heard a bunch of bad words said about Abraham, but God never said a bad word about him. Every time he mentioned him, he held him up as an as a example of faith. <laughs> Out of this date in the text, we've known a few things about Abraham. We know his father, Tira, and his brothers, Haran and Nahor. We know that he married Sarah, and Sarah was barren from the time they were married. We know he left Ur of the Chaldees. He arrived in Haran and he stayed there and increased till God called him to go leave Haran and he left at 75. We have a record of his arrival in Canaan after his, he left uh, Haran after his father died and his brother, one of his brothers died before they ever left Ur of the Chaldees. In 75, he departs from Haran. He arrives in Canaan, goes to the interior of the country. There's a famine there. So he, now remember, it's 1,500 miles from, Her, from Ur to Sikkim, where he, where he ended up. We're not talking about taking a train or a plane here. And from Haran, he's herding a bunch of flocks on the way from here. He picked up a lot of possessions in Haran, the scripture tells us. So he's moving. His, he, of course, it was only 700 miles from Haran to Canaan. So he's, he's walking. He's 700 miles herding all these flocks. Comes to Canaan. He's got more than himself and his wife. He's got three, at least 318 servants. <laughs> Famine in the land. So he goes down and then God appears to him in Canaan. Says, I'm going to give this land to you. 
to your seed. He tells them first, to your seed. And when you this land to your seed. So Abraham moves to Bethel. He builds an altar there, calls it the name of the Lord. And then because of the famine, he goes down to Egypt, has this encounter with Pharaoh. He's thinking, see, of the promise of God. I'm going to give this land to your seed. He doesn't have any seed. <laughs> he doesn't have any. So he tells Sarah, uh, someone asked you who you are, say you're my sister, which she was his half-sister. They had the same father, not the same mother. And then he had this episode with Pharaoh, you remember, down in Egypt. And God sided with Abraham. That's right. he, I've heard preachers side with <laughs> dummies. They are, I'm telling you, I don't know where some of these people come from. But God Almighty plagued the house of Pharaoh because of Sarah and Abraham. And finally, she, he was, she was delivered out of that. Here's some of Abraham's experiences, see. Then Abraham, he was, when he left Egypt, at that point it says he's very rich. He picked up some stuff there in Egypt. We know that Pharaoh gave him a lot of things. Increased his possessions. And when he comes to uh, Canaan again, he ends up in, near Hebron. And God appears to him and says, I'm going to give this land to you and your seed. Now what I want you to do, I want you to just like, look over this land from up here in this high place. Look over this land. See, so far as you can see, I'm going to give this to you. So Abraham does that. Looks over the land. Then we have a little a bit diversion. And God reveals, after he's told Abraham that one year before Sarah was born, not one minute before, one year before Sarah, Isaac was born, God told Abraham Sarah was going to be the mother. He yeah. didn't know this until then. That's right. Huh? <laughs> well, that put, does put a little different slant on some of the experiences. But at that time, God revealed he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, I can't hide this from my servant Abraham. And so he reveals it, and Abraham pleads for the righteous. Yeah. He must have been thinking about Lot, that righteous man, as Peter calls him. And he must have been thinking about it, so Abraham pled for Lot, you remember? Then Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed. Then we leap to this incident with Hagar, where Sarah said, look, you're getting older, and I can't have any children. So I'm going to give you my handmaid, which was a practice. Jacob did this. Isaac did this. The 12 tribes of Israel, most of them were born from handmaids. So this was, this was a practice at that time. Well, Isaac, Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. And uh, he didn't turn out too well. She had to be expelled from the house, you remember? Then Abraham, he makes a covenant with Abimelech, who was king of Gerar, where he was staying. And he sojourned in the land of Philistines for many days, it says. Then he was tested by God. God told him to offer up Isaac. See, this is covering a, a kind of a lengthy period of time. At the time of Isaac's offering, Isaac... It's probably in his 30s. I'll, I'll track this off for you later, but this is, been, this is rather a long period of time. We're talking about like 50 or 60 years. And what I've told you, this is all you know. Why, why if someone could write a biography of you and stick it on a three by five card, we'd say, well, what kind of person is that? You know, the thicker the biography, the better it is. That's how men think, see? I'm making a point here, see, brother, how, he, how God shaped how you think about this. He, yet all these are epochs yeah. in his life. He tries Abraham's face, says, take now your son, your only son, whom you love. <clears throat> Offer him as a burnt offering to me. On a, one of the, it's out there by the land of Moriah. I'll, I'll tell you on your way there. And Abraham didn't say, oh, no, why me? You know, <laughs> He did. Early the next morning, he got up, chopped wood, got everything ready, went there. And if he, he wasn't like depressed or anything like this because as he raises the knife to kill Isaac, the angel of the Lord says, Abraham, Abraham, and he stops. Oh, the average guy would just have been too late. He killed him. Showing what faith does. See, faith responds instantly. This is the point. 
that you want to see. Then after that, uh, we're at the point we are now in the text. Yes. Citizens and elves that we talked about last time is um, when he was preparing for it, he didn't do it sloppily. He That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Put the wood in order on the altar, tied Isaac up. Yeah. See, faith isn't afraid of details. It really isn't. Some people say, well, do I have to be baptized? I say, no, you can go to hell if you want. If you don't want to be, I don't want to baptize you. Mm -hmm. That's right. Amen. That's the way it is. Because faith wants to do what God says. Yes. Yes. So if someone doesn't want to do what God says, well, then we got we got a little more work to do before we uh, was able to do it. When I'm showing you, Abraham did what God said to do, and it was a hard thing, brethren, to do. Right. This was contrary to nature, contrary to everything man knows. And he... Uh, he told the two young men that were with him at the foot of the mountain, and they got to the mountain. He says, well, I and the lad are going to go and worship, and then we'll, we'll come again. <laughs> yeah, I told him, I'm, I'm a member of the coming down the hill church. When they went up, that's a lot different than when they were coming down. And that's when that first substitutionary offering was recorded in Scripture. The first offering that is categorically said to be in the stead of somebody else. That's the first one, so God introduced us to that. <coughs> now think of the people in Scripture and, and the kind of history they've had. Let's take Adam, Adam, for example. He lived 930 years. And about all you know about Adam is that he, he sinned. Well, he named the animals, and he, he gave a dissertation on the role of a wife. That's... <laughs> 930 years. That's what you know. Why? Because that's what God, that's how you want, God wants you to remember Adam like that. It all got started back there. That's right. It didn't get started with your mama and your papa. Mm -hmm. Or your job or your experience. That's where sin got started. Right back there. See, no psychiatrist will tell you that. Yeah. But that's the truth of the matter. That's where, as by one, many were made sinners. Yeah. That's the scripture teaches, Romans 5. Think about Eve. What do you know about Eve? Zip. Mm -hmm. What about Cain? You don't know how old he was. You don't know how old Eve died, was when she died. You have no idea how old Cain was. And what you know about him is he was a, a rebel. What about Abel? What do you know about him? You don't, you don't have any idea how old he was when he was killed. All you know is he offered a sacrifice that was acceptable to God. We you know about Nimrod. There's, a, there's the first famous person in the Bible, and there's two verses in the Bible about him. Yeah. Two, that's it. We don't know how old he, long he lived. I'm showing you that there's important people or acts in it all through Scripture. Enoch, he left the earth, he was like a teenager. Just 365 when he was translated. In 300 years he walked with the Lord. Jude gives us one of his prophecies, but that's that's it. That's what you know about, about Enoch. And Noah, he lived 950 years. He lived 20 years longer than Adam did. He lived 950 years, and about all we really know about him is he built an ark. But then that's how he wants you to remember, that he built an ark to the saving of his house. <laughs> Mrs. Noah and the kids would have been saved if it wasn't for Noah. That's right. He is called the eighth person. At, uh, so God's teaching you something. He's teaching you one person can be saved because of another person. Yeah. Now you ought to be able to put two and two together and see what that's all about. Ham, Shem, and Japheth, we don't know very much about them. Abraham, he lived to be 175 years. We know quite a bit about him. There's a lot of details about him. Why? Because he's a pivotal person in Scripture. He's more important than Adam was. Yeah. Even though Adam, the effect of what Adam did was more far-reaching, Adam all dies. <laughs> yeah. But he's a very important person. Lot, we don't know how long he lived. We don't know much about him. We do, God called him a righteous person. It was vexed his righteous soul every day with the 
filthy conversation of the wicked. Isaac, he lived 180 years. We know a few things about him, not as much as we know about Isaac. Jacob, we know a little bit, quite a bit about Jacob. He lived to be 147 years old. We know a lot about him. See, I, I give this so you, you can see the strategy that's in Scripture. Scripture's not like a history book, a chronological history book. There is a sort of a chronology in it, I understand, but it has to do with more with how God's purpose is progressing. The truth of the matter is, for the better part of the first 2,000 years of history, God's purpose wasn't progressing very far. We were getting things ready. He had to convince mankind that they were sinners and needed a Savior. This took a long time. It took about 4,000 years to get this done. Some few souls, like David, some of the people, they picked up on it, but not many people saw this. It took a long time for God to convince the world they needed who he was sending. Amen. And we still live in a society. People, th they don't know they need Christ. Some few souls do understand. We thank God for them. But most people don't think they need Christ. That's why they don't call on the name of the Lord. That's why they don't seek him. So there was a time of preparation. You think of the personal histories that are developed in Scripture. Men like Moses and Aaron, the prophets, and John the Baptist, and Zacharias, and Elizabeth, and so forth. I named some of them. People that, when the world is pretty thickly populated, but they, certain people were accented by the Lord. Let me say a word that the contemporary practice of psychoanalyzing the saints of Scripture, this, you couldn't possibly be more wrong. It's an attempt to make the people of Scripture be like people are today. When the accent of Scripture is the people today ought to be like the people of Scripture. <laughs> They ought to be like Moses and Abraham, David, see, sen sensitive like David, discerning like Moses, faithful like Abraham. That's the accent of Scripture. But men try and drag these people down. We're not saying they were sinless. God knows that there's no such thing as a sinless person. But that's not how God wants them to be remembered. So I'm against the person that tries to make me remember these people for what they did they think was wrong because that's not how God asked us to remember them. Amen. Now you want to project yourself up to the day of judgment, you'll be glad then that God's this way. <laughs> if you're in Christ Jesus, <coughs> technically, you could have pointed out a lot of things about your life. But when Jesus steps forward and says, he's, he's with me, Father, and he confesses you, <laughs> you'll be glad this is the way God thinks, see? But he's teaching you. He's teaching you now in Scripture. This is the way he thinks. When he sets his eye on someone, he begins to work with someone, and that person responds to him, and he puts them in his memory bank. They that feared the Lord spake off on one with another. The Lord hearkened and heard it and said, Ha ha, they're going to be my jewels. And I'm going to put them in my book of remembrance. That's how God is. All right, now let's stop. Our text says that Sarah was 127 years old when she died. I think, I think Sarah's the only woman in the Bible that we know how old she was when she died. I, I couldn't find anyone else. I reserve the right to be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's kind of unique, isn't it? In fact, you don't know the age of many women in the Bible. There are not many women you know the age of them. It's interesting. We do know the age of Anna. Now, we have to kind of calculate it. She was of great age, had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity, and she was a widow of about four score and seven years. So how old she was when she got married, we don't know. She lived, she was, before her husband died, she lived with him seven years, and then she was 84 years a widow. Now, if she was married at 13, which I have serious doubts about that, that'd make her about 104 at the time she went and testified to all her waiting for redemption in Jerusalem. If she was 20, that'd make her about 120, 124. See. <laughs> 
Now there's someone that's old age, and who who did who did God charge as soon as He wants to make the Messiah known? Who did He select? An old man and an old woman. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. That's God for you. Now we want to Sarah. We we don't know. She we know she was ten years younger than Abraham. We know that from Genesis 17 when Abraham said uh, he was a hundred, Sarah was ninety. So she was ten years younger than. Abraham. So that makes Sarah 65 when they left Haran and headed for Canaan. When Ishmael was born, Sarah was 76. When Ishmael was circumcised, she was 89. And when God appeared unto Abraham, Abraham, telling him she would bear, he would bear, she would bear Isaac, she was 89. And she was 90 when Isaac was born. That's kind of the peaks of her life. That's that's it. Now she had a variety of experiences. I won't go over them all. Some of them were hard. I don't know how hard it was for a woman to make a trip of 1,500 miles, but I have an idea. It required some effort. She endured that. She's the one, you remember, that gave counsel to cast out Hagar, remember, and her, bond, and her son, and God said, do what Sarah said. Said, told Abraham, hearken to the voice of your wife. And he did. Yeah. As soon as God said to do it, he did it. So Sarah died. She died in Kerjath Arba, which later is called Hebron, in the land of Canaan. She died. Now, it's another stern reminder, isn't it? Yeah. That the sin passed upon all men. Fifty times the Bible, fifty plus times the Bible reads, he died, he died, she died. Even though the people lingered for a long time, I don't doubt that when like Noah, uh, Abraham, excuse me, Adam, he's 930 years old, I don't doubt that Satan came maybe like he was 900 and said, see, you're, you're not going to die, I told you you wouldn't die. I mean, it's been 900 years, come on, you're not going to die. You ever think about that? But he died. You can imagine what the physical constitution of people were back then. They weren't immortal, as you know. They, they lived because they ate the tree of life. In fact, if they'd have been able to eat from the tree of life, they'd have lived on in their sin forever. That's what God said. See? Before you get over, I passed this thing about Sarah. It's, um, you know, it says repeatedly that the Lord appeared unto Abraham. He, that, yeah. But it never says that he appeared unto it's Sarah. Sarah yeah. So it's her her faith had to be rooted in, 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 in believing what Abraham told her about these accounts. Yeah, that, that the Lord had appeared unto me and yeah. we're going to leave her. See, so she, she went with him. She was faithful. Yeah. But I can see how this... This, this kind of highlights her, her um, faithfulness to Abraham and that you know, we don't read anything where she argued with him or, no. or you know, it's, but she just obeyed him. I thought that was interesting. Though. Yes, it is. She was in the tent when she laughed. Oh, yeah, she was in. Yeah. Yes, she overheard that time when he told her. <laughs> yeah. And remember, she said, I didn't laugh. He said, nay, he yeah. says, you did laugh. Yeah. And that was all that was said, but that that but that was that was all that needed to be yeah. said. Right. See, Sarah yeah. said... <laughs> Yeah. She's also the one that mm -hmm. got Abraham to sleep with Hagar. Oh yeah, she did. And yes. One of the things that I don't know if you covered this before. Oh yeah, we did. Because mm -hmm. of of her lack of belief. Okay, Abraham had belief, but he followed her, saying, "Okay, okay." I'll well, do see, what God hadn't revealed Sarah that's, that's was true. In fact, right. he hadn't revealed that Abraham. He didn't reveal for many years that Abraham was going to father the seed. So this this was there. They were. The idea is that there's consequences when we try to oh, yeah. help God. Well, the consequences are the Arabs are Ishmael's line. Oh, I understand. And the only thing we hear about Ishmael is your line is always going to be against oh, the yes. Jews. Oh, yes. But see, even today. you can't believe without a word. And there was no word about Sarah bearing a child until that incident. I'm going to give you a But he didn't seat. tell he didn't tell through Sarah and he didn't tell him through him at first. That's when he pled for Eliezer. He said, Oh, the Eliezer. He didn't tell him him. Then the second time he appeared, he said, Out of your bowels. See, some years had passed since then. So Yeah, we, we dealt with that. It was 
Once Sarah knew, yeah. and, and beside that, there's enough in Scripture about nations turning to God that you realize that some of these offspring, it's not over yet. Some of these Eastern, it's not over yet. He said, I'm going to take Assyria, and I'm going to take Egypt, and I'm going to take Israel, and I'm going to join them together. Well, this is, remember he said his seed would be multitude and the seed. Well, think, they're the better part of that region. When the knowledge of the Lord covers the earth, as the waters cover the sea, well, the offspring of Ishmael look a little bit different there. But you're right in that this is a product of human reasoning, and it sure caused stirring up a lot of trouble. But it was, but it was because of lack of understanding. It wasn't lack of faith; it's lack of understanding. They thought they were doing because it, it hadn't been working out. So they thought, well, we, God must mean that we're to do it. Uh -huh. People still do this. Oh, yeah. Maybe we're, and sometimes there are things. Sometimes you do have to work out. But blessed yeah. is the person who can distinguish. Amen. <laughs> Faith by by having uh, her faith caused her to mm -hmm. to yes. want him to to go to Hagar because she knew the seed was supposed to come and she thought she wasn't going to be able to be uh -huh. the one to bear the seed. Mm -hmm. And is of the twelve tribes of Israel, most of them were born from handmaids. So this was an unusual for the time. But if we think. Think what Sarah thought about it when all of this dawned. Yeah. <laughs> think how she reviewed this this thing also. Yeah. Uh, Kerjath Arabah, that city is mentioned five times in Scripture. It, the last time it was mentioned is in Nehemiah. Some people were living in that city in Nehemiah's day, which was roughly. 1,449 years from the time of Sarah. I mean, that's how long cities lasted. Back in, yeah. People talk about cities lasted. City of Nineveh is still around. Huh? Just a long-term city. Hebrews not mentioned in the New Testament scripture. <coughs> it was upstaged by Jerusalem. Wasn't, Hebron wasn't far from Jerusalem. But when Jerusalem was established, God put his name there. And when it comes to a city in Canaan, Jerusalem was the centerpiece. <clears throat> I note the fact that Sarah did die in the land of Canaan, the land promised. Abraham never did go back to Ur of the Chaldees. It was not working out too well here. Let's go back. He stayed where God sent him. Here's how the scripture stated. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. I get the picture. He's in Canaan. He surveys Canaan. And he says, God, there's got to be more than this. He knew enough about God. How else would you look for a city whose builder and maker is God? See, that doesn't kind of make sense of those times, but it's faith. Faith goes deep. When faith hears a word from God and sight doesn't shape up with it, it says that there's got to be something that's, that's beyond sight that's going to answer this. Now this is the way God works. God establishes an inheritance first. Then he announces it. Then people are called upon to believe what about that inheritance and shape their lives around that inheritance and become familiar with it with like samplings of it that they'll receive living in an awareness of it. This is the same way it is for you in Christ. God has an inheritance, an eternal inheritance. We've been called to an eternal inheritance. See? It's there already. Now he's He's introduced it to us with life in Christ. We have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We've been given everything pertains to life and godliness. We have access to God with confidence. We have an intercessor in heaven. Got an intercessor inside of you. He's, and he's introducing you with grace and mercy and peace and love. He's introducing you to what it constitutes your inheritance. You're just seeing samples of it like grapes of Eshcol. 
but he's acquainting you with it because no one's going to go to heaven that doesn't want to go. Yeah. Amen. Wouldn't make sense, would it? I don't want to, I don't want to get the glory and find out here's another pastel of people that didn't want to be there. I spent enough time with those kind of people, haven't you? Yes. Amen. So that's what this is doing. He's acquainting you like he did Abraham. He said, walk through the land now. Survey the land. David said, now walk through Jerusalem. Look at those bulwarks and look at those towers. Look what we've got, the sampling. we got it preparing, you see, for the inheritance. For those in Christ Jesus, if you keep your mind on this inheritance and you shape your life around it, look forward to having it, to being with the Lord forever, see, then God will keep you. He'll keep you from falling. He'll do it now. Amen. He'll keep you from falling. Right. But if you don't keep this in your mind, you're at once vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Sa Satan's got stuff he will set before you yeah. to try and capture your, uh, your attention. All right, Sarah died. Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. In the Word of God, whenever righteous people died, there was always mourning. Yeah. When Jacob died, the Egyptians mourned for 70 days. When Jacob died, yeah. 70 days. When Moses died, Israel wept and mourned for 30 days. When Aaron died, Israel mourned another 30 days. When King Josiah died, all Judah and Jerusalem mourned at his death. When Stephen the martyr, there was great lamentation made over him. Oh, they didn't lament and mourn as those that have no hope. No, no sake about that. They mourn because there's few enough of God's people. When some of them were taken, there's like a hole. Now, people don't do this these days, but let me tell you, when people of godly influence die, someone's got to rise up and fill the gap. Yes. Amen. Someone's got to step in there. Take up the banner. Not common these days. Used to be hear people talk about this a little bit more. But One can scarcely imagine, for instance, the death of John the Baptist. His disciples came and took his headless carcass. Think what an experience that was. Went out and buried him. They went and told Jesus. You know what Jesus did? He left and went over across the sea, but spent some time by himself. Hmm. I imagine the great heart of Jesus must remember that day when he strode down to the rivers of Jordan. John baptized him. John tried to talk him out of being baptized, and Jesus said no. Got people today, people trying to talk them into being baptized, and they said, "Oh, interesting. That's gonna that comparison is gonna be made." He must have remembered that, how boldly called men to repentance, stood up against the scribes and Pharisees. He said, "You generation of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come?" Yes. Yeah, I see it. When men like that leave the scene, there's a mourning to be had. Now, one of the <laughs> effects of Babylon the Great, which is Satan's fictitious church, is reduced the value of men and women of God. Now, organizers and promoters and entertainers and people like this, they are the people who have the value. Same thing has happened today that happened in Isaiah's day. It's been duplicated, except it's worse now because it's in more light has been given. Judgment is turned away backward and justice stands afar off. Truth is fallen in the street. And equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth. And he that departeth from evil makes himself a prey. Yeah, if you're really serious about God, you, you look like a freak mm -hmm. to the average churchman. You're an oddball. But it's said 
It displeased the Lord that there was no judgment. God took note of this. And here's how he reacted to this. That a person departed from iniquity, made himself a prey. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and, and helmet of salvation upon his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing according to their deeds. Accordingly shall he pay, we pay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the islands. He will repay recompense. That was God's reaction to that kind of society. Now there's no way to estimate the seriousness of a system of religion that hides the persons of God and Christ Amen. and underestimates the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It, I, there's no way you can really calculate this, how serious this is. It's, more, it's complicated because it's more difficult to fight the good fight of faith. See, because you're coming up against a religious structure. When you, when you fight the good fight of faith, you are, in, you are set in opposition to religious structures. This, and unless you're determined, you finally just kind of give up and it fizzles out. But Sarah was righteous. Abraham's in a strange land. He mourns for her anyway. He stands up. He's not going to cremate her. He stands up before the sons of, sons of Heth. Heth was the son of Canaan. <laughs> Who was cursed by God. You remember that? He was cursed to be a servant. Here's Abraham. He rises up to the sons of Heth. Who's, who eventually are going to be servants of his offspring. He stood up before his dead. He's from beside his dead. She, she, she was right there. The body was right there. He stood up before the dead. Notice he has full control of his emotions here. He's, yeah. he's very lucid in his thinking. Yeah. He's not sorrowing as someone has no hope. He's, he's, he's got control of the situation. I'm a stranger and a foreigner with you. <laughs> this is the land Abram was to inherit. He's, this is his land by inheritance, but he hadn't got it yet. Yeah. It's still under the control of the heathen. So as long as they're there, he's a foreigner and a stranger. Now you kind of have to make the application. <laughs> it's one thing to be a stranger and a foreigner in the world. It's another thing to be a stranger and a foreigner in the church. Shall I say professed or church? But that's the case, isn't it? Isn't that the case? There's people that are serious about the Lord. They're, they're strangers and foreigners in the professed church contemporary church. They just don't fit in. So that church isn't our inheritance, of course. That kind of thing isn't our inheritance. Now let's ask ourselves the question. Now he's a stranger and a foreigner. How long had he been there? He's a stranger and a foreigner. How? He'd been there at least 60 years. <laughs> so much for naturalized citizenship. You don't become a citizen because you're just there a long time. Right. you got to have the nature that fits in that country. Yeah. Speak the language of that country. And he uh, was his land by inheritance, but not yet. See, at the time of Sarah gave Hagar to Ishmael, that was 10 years. It says that he'd been there 10 years at that time. Then at the time Ishmael was circumcised, that's 13 years more. Then at the time Isaac was weaned, that's at least three years more. And at the time Sarah died, she's 127, which means Abraham's 137. So he'd been there 60 years. Still a stranger in the country, still a sojourner. Those are in Christ Jesus. I mean, I've known saints that have lived to be more than 100 but they are still strangers and pilgrims. Right. They never could blend in with the world. It doesn't make any difference how long you live in the world, brethren. If you keep your faith, you can never be joined to it. Amen. You're a stranger in it. 
Sometimes there's certain experiences that accentuate this and you become very keenly aware that you don't belong here. This is not your place. But we've been promised that we're going to inherit the earth. Amen. It's going to be ours. Yeah. It'll be uh, refined. <laughs> Purged by fire. First time he destroyed it by water, but the next time by fire. And we're going to get a new earth. It's going to be... Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. The psalm says, and delight themselves in an abundance of peace. That's a sign you got what belongs to you when there's peace. <laughs> Though the saints are called dearly beloved, strangers and pilgrims. Now let's abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. That's the lusts that, that tie you to this world. There's desires and ambitions and wants that nail your head to the world like Sisera nailed like Sisera's head was nailed to the world by jail. You remember that when she took that nail, nailed his head to the earth? That's what Satan, that's what he's abstained from these lusts. Now you've got to figure these out for yourself. You, these can't be like itemized because they're different. They're different for different people. For instance, if you want to tempt Jesus, you can't, you can't offer him to be like president of the local Kwan's club. I mean, that isn't going to tempt Jesus. You've got to offer him the kingdoms of the world and the glory of others. See, that's, <laughs> that's the only thing Satan did, and it didn't work. And then, incidentally, Jesus was tempted in all points, like we are. Lust of flesh, lust of that, and lust of pride of life. Have any of you ever been tempted to turn stone into a stone into bread? I never have. Jesus was. He is a special. He's a special. He. Let me tell you that the further you go with Christ, the stronger temptation becomes. Not that the pull is stronger. The scope of it is is bigger. You got to maintain that strangership. If you keep that in mind, I'm a stranger and I'm a pilgrim. A pilgrim means I'm passing through. So. Abram was just passing through. He'd been passing through for 60 years. <laughs> for 60 years he'd been passing through. <coughs> now there is one distinction that makes us different from Abraham. That is that now in Christ Jesus we're born again. Amen. That's a distinction that didn't exist before. He had faith. The kind of faith, well, that saves but he wasn't born again in the sense that you are because sin had not yet been taken away. See, all sin had to be taken away before any sin could be forgiven. It all had to be judged by God, condemned by God, cursed by God. He did it in the person of Christ. He couldn't do it in anybody else. He condemned sin in the flesh. That's in the flesh of Christ. He bore our sins in his body on the tree. And until that happened, nobody could be born again. Amen. But it has happened. Amen. Now we got the edge. We can learn things a bit quicker now that we're in Christ. Because the new man is created after the likeness of God in all righteousness and true holiness. That's how it's created. Huh? Oh, that's a marvelous thing. Amen. Now God's, uh, God's promise of the land to Abraham, now remember he was a so sojourner in the land, God promised him. Acts 13, 15, All the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, to thy seed forever. Verse 70, Walk through the land, in the length of it, in the breadth of it, I will give it unto thee. 15, 7, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land, to inherit it. And then I, I list some of the other texts there where he says this. He, God also promised this land to Isaac, Genesis 26, 3. Unto thee and unto thy seed will I give all these countries and will perform the oath which I swear to Abram thy father. He also promised it to Jacob. Behold, the Lord stood above it, that's this ladder, and was stretched from earth on heaven, to heaven, and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it. So he stated this over and over and over again. 
Yet neither Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob ever did, while they were in the world, get an inheritance in it. By faith, Hebrews 11.8 says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he would after receive for inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. How long uh, can you be faithful without being able to really show a lot of evidence that you got something from God? I mean, how long can you do it? You've got a case here that did at least 60 years. He couldn't produce any tangible evidence that this land belonged to him. That's, but that's why he did not go back to Ur. He did not go back to Haran. He stayed right there because he knew eventually I'm getting this land. He didn't get it while he was in the world. I can only conclude he's going to get it in the world to come. Those in Christ, if the Lord says, I give them eternal life and they'll never perish. You got to believe that like Abraham believed that promise he received. It may not look like you're going to get eternal life. Things may not be working out like you think they ought to work out. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. You hold on to that. Don't let it get out of your hand. If he says you'll inherit the earth, you lay hold of it. As it took, you look around and say, it's all going to be mine someday. If he says, if uh, we're heirs of God and join heirs with Christ, how, that's, what about inheriting God? I mean, what, what about that? Is there something Satan could offer that could offset inheriting God? Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ? And it says he's going to inherit everything. Guys, I'm a sojourner, a stranger. I'm looking now for a plot of land to bury my wife in this in this land I'm sojourning in. And the children of Heth, they they speak up. Children of Heth answered Abram, saying unto him, Hear us, my lord, thou art a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulchres, bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulchre, that thou mayest bury thy dead. How gracious they were. Now an American Christian would say, this is an answer to prayer. I won't have to pay anything. Oh yeah. This is what a, what a TV watching Christian, this is what they'd say. They'd say, this is wonderful. I'm going to have this, they're just going to give it to me. You're a mighty prince. You know that word mighty is? And that's Elohim. Mighty one. Same for God. Some of the versions picked up on this. Other versions say you're a great prince among us. Not American Standard Version and several others read you're a prince of God. You're God's chosen one. Thou art in the midst of us a king from God. That's the Septuagint version. A king by God. American Apostolic Bible. You're no mere outsider here with us. You're a prince of God. That's the Message Bible. In a linear reads, you're a prince of Elohim. Now the pulpit commentary which normally has a lot of good things to say, adds this, a prince of Elohim, not of Jehovah, since the speakers were heathen whose ideas of deity did not transcend those expressed in the term Elohim. That is a foolish observation. God Almighty appeared to their leader, Abimelech, and Abimelech knew who it was. And Abimelech told all his servants what was told him. So these people knew about God. They weren't ignorant of God. Now everybody might not say this of you, but you want to live so people can at least, who are open-minded, can draw this kind of conclusion. You're a man, you're a man or you're a woman of God. Yeah, 
And sometimes it'll surprise the people that will say this. They'll see it. You're a man or woman of God. And if they do, you know that it's by God's grace that you're that way. <laughs> it's inexcusable for any supposed expositor of the Bible to treat this saying as though it was an acknowledgement of earthly greatness. That's, that's inexcusable. We just won't buy their Bibles anymore. Actually, this, you're a mighty prince. This fulfilled, this was a fulfillment of a promise God made to Abraham. In Genesis 12, 2, I will make of thee a great nation, I will bless thee, and make thy name great. All right, here it is. There it was, he made it great. And he dialogued with him, communed with him, said, if, I, if it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me, Ephron, the son of Zoar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he hath, which is at the end of his field, for as much money as it is worth, he shall give it me for a possession of a burying place. Cave of Machpelah. To this day, 2012, the, the structure that's pictured here is built over the cave of Machpelah. It is a sacred place to the Jews. To this day, still there, there's a picture of it taken not many years ago. It's located in Mamre, which is Hebron, where Abraham had chosen to dwell. And we dwelt in the plains of Mamre, that God appeared to him, and he, that's where he chose to dwell. This piece of property is mentioned several times in Scripture. It's said to have been before Mamre, we'd say near Mamre, or facing Mamre, and here's, here's a couple of complete statements of the location of the cave of, that he asked for. The cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. Here it is again, Genesis 49:30. In the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan. So, <laughs> that's, that's where Joseph wanted to be buried. Ended up, Moses actually buried him someplace else, but... It was, in, it was in Canaan. The death and burial of Sarah was the first death and burial of the chosen generation. Huh? This is the first death and burial of the chosen generation of Abraham. Here, first one. And he handled it well, didn't he? You know, we... We do not own what we presently have in salvation. We're stewards of it. We don't own it yet. It's not our own. If we're faithful over that which belongs to another, then God will give you your own. But you, you, you don't own it yet. You're a steward of it. You're called to be a faithful, a good, a faithful steward. Handle it well. Invest it properly. Lay treasures up for yourself in heaven. Because what you have is just a small portion of what you're going to get. So he's introducing you to it. He's testing you out. God, I mean, God knows all the answers. I understand that. But there's more here. They're more watching than God. There's all the holy angels and principalities and powers. He's demonstrating his wisdom to them. Ephesians 3, 9 says, so they're watching. God working out his purpose. So they're watching. See how you respond. Oh, they must have shouted for joy at the response of Abraham here. I hope they do the same for you. See, there are a lot of people, they, they don't, they're not good stewards. They only give a small portion of their time and resources to the Lord. Just a small portion. Their lives are dominated by the temporal rather than eternal things. Their participation with fellowship with Christ is kind of sparse, minimal. Their ingestion of the Word of God is so small it can hardly be measured. They don't put on the new man. They don't put on the whole armor. They don't use the weapons of our warfare. They forsake the gathering themselves together. Other interests overshadow holy interests. They're not living by faith. They're not walking in the spirit. They're not continuing steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. When it comes to their money, they rob God. 
He has people like this. They don't realize what they've got is on loan. It's got to be turned back with interest. Whatever may be said of such people, they're not strangers and pilgrims in the earth. So they may be church members and in high standing and all of this sort of thing and professors at the local cemetery. But after all said and done, if they're not good and faithful servants, they're not strangers and pilgrims because they've been, they've been nailed to the earth. Work out your own salvation. Fear and trembling means exactly what it says. And only the people who do, in fact, work out their own salvation with fear and trembling, get anything out of the next verse, for it's God that works in you both the will and do of his own good pleasure. But you don't know that until you're... We know this is the case. It's demonstrated in Abraham. God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. He didn't know where he was going. But along the way, he found out. He told him to go to a mountain. He'd show him later, offer Isaac up on a mountain. He didn't tell him where it was, but along the way, he found out where it is. All right, that's the way it is with you. As you live unto the Lord, the Lord opens this thing up to you. And he begins to make sense to you. Because it's hard to live godly when it doesn't make sense. I mean, this, this can't, I don't think this can be done. But as it he opens up to you, it all makes perfect sense to be a stranger and a pilgrim in the earth. Now, uh, the sons of Seth said, no, none of us will withhold our sepulcher. Look, we, we've got, they probably had good sepulchers too. You can take whichever one you want. It's all yours. Now, there's some things they didn't realize, of course. They didn't realize that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Rebekah and Leah, they were going to be buried there too. <laughs> they were just thinking about Sarah. See, Abraham, he's got a long, he's got the long long view. All the fathers are buried there. All their wives are buried there except Rachel. She was buried in Bethlehem because they were en route traveling when she died. They didn't, they didn't know all these people were going to be buried there. They were just thinking of uh, Sarah. So Abraham, he stood up before the people and he in a nutshell said no you're going to have to give me a price on this. I'm going to buy this. It's got to be a fair price. It's got to be the going price. I'll pay it. It reminded me a lot of uh, his confrontation with the king of Sodom. You remember that? King of Sodom said, um, you know what the Sodomites were known for. He says, give me the men. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't to plow fields with, brethren. Let's be right up front about it. Give me the men. You take the goods. Remember? Abraham said, I'll not take a shoe latchet from you, yeah. lest you said you made me rich. Mm -hmm. This is similar here, see? Yeah. Yeah. No, he's not going to take it for nothing. He's going to pay for it. I don't know. I, I don't object to this. Do you object to this? That, that when you can, you just pay your way through? I, I don't object to this. I feel better yeah. about this. I feel better. I don't feel right about taking gifts from the ungodly. Yeah. That's why I never was a good fundraiser, you know, for the, yeah. <laughs> for the school, because I, I told I can't, I can't do this. I can't, I can't ask an adulterer to, for a gift to the college. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, you know, they, it wasn't hard for them to solve, but I felt a lot better after it. Yeah. No, 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 don't bring the price of a whore or a dog into the tabernacle, remember? Yeah. Incidentally, dog in scripture does mean male sodomite. That is what the word means. So if a woman is making her money on the street, some people might be suppressed, impressed if she gave a big offering to the church, but God says, ah, you don't want it. So Abraham says, no, I'll, uh, I'll pay for it, thank you. And so he said, well, the field's worth 400 shekels. Of silver. Well, silver is worth about ten dollars an ounce in our day. So at that rate, this would be calculated out about sixty-four thousand dollars, you know, in our in today's money. So that's what it's worth. And so Abraham weighed it out. Right away, he weighed it out. How much it was. 
there, look what happened. <laughs> he got the field. He got the cave. He got the trees around there and the trees in the whole area. See, he got a lot of, lot of things there. Paid for it. I'll give thee money for the field. And you notice in the transaction there was a mutual respect. You want to note that. It's what we might call, what the apostle would call, this is approved, uh, acceptable to God and approved by men. That, that kind of thing. And you want to, you do want to live your life in such a manner as that noble people at least see that you've done what was, what was right. Now this, uh, they purchased. This is an example of redemption. He redeemed the land. He purchased the land. Now of course this is uh, quite a picture of redemption in Christ Jesus. We've been redeemed. We've been purchased. With the precious blood of Christ. Now, unlike Abraham's transaction, this wasn't according to the world's merchandisers. It's a special price. Sin had created a debt to God, a debt that had to be paid. It couldn't be erased. It couldn't be spoken away. God couldn't acquit the transgressor or clear the guilty. Uh, this is something that couldn't be spoken away. He could speak light into existence. He could speak stars into existence, but he could not speak sin away. Because sin violated his nature. Sin had to be judged in toto. Every bit of it. It had to be judged by God, cursed by God, and removed from his presence. Now enters Christ. Christ actually volunteered for this mission. He said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. In the volume of the book, it's written of me. Thou hast prepared for me a body. And he gave him a special... See, your body was made so you could live. Christ's body was made so you could die. Yeah, and he took all the iniquities of us all, as Isaiah said, and he laid them upon this incarnate Christ. Peter says he bore our sins in his body on the tree. The impact of this upon the spirit of Christ is unimaginable. Christ had never in any sense felt any kind of defilement. Never. Never. Now. It is as though he is responsible for the sins of the whole world from Adam to the end. Yeah. It's all deposited on him. Nobody, no one else could have borne this. This had to be done. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, you know, he made him to be sin for us. Galatians 3.13 says he, he was made a curse for us. And then God Zechariah said his own sword, he awakened it against the shepherd. And it was God who slew Jesus. It wasn't Pilate, it wasn't Herod. Over, uh, externally they killed him, I understand that. <laughs> but he was delivered up yeah. by God. The price was paid to God because the debt was owed to God. Amen. And just to confirm that this whole transaction is acceptable to God. God saw the travail of his soul as he agonized there upon the tree. He saw the travail of his soul. He said, That's, I'm satisfied. Amen. Amen. Now anyone who will accept this will come to me clean Amen. with sins remitted. God. No record against him. That's how you were bought. When he says you're not your own, you're bought with a price. That's what he's talking about. Yes, See, that God made you. Then he bought you. Mm -hmm. 
He didn't present the sacrifice when he made man. He presented the sacrifice when men had gone astray and he brought them back. The redemption was to retrieve the man. It was, there was no redemption offered at the creation. It was offered at the recreation, for the recreation. That's how it was offered. Now you belong to Christ. You are Christ and Christ is God's. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, we got the better end of this deal. Because Jesus is able to keep you from falling. Now this is written in Scripture. This is not just theology. He's able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. Why? Because of this because of this purchase. This redemption. Now Abraham buried his wife in his purchase. But we walk around and live in, in ours. The field was made sure. He went about it so that no one ever have any questions about this. He said, legal, everything right. And the place was noted for a burying place. Now, there's been a lot of debate these days about what you do with dead bodies. Some people will say you burn them because it's more economical and you can have a nice cremated body for 3700 and cost you 7000 7500 to bury the body. And so if you have to face the dead, the funeral director will present this to you. And I'm surprised at it, but a lot of Christian people are very sloppy in how they think about this. See, the body doesn't belong to you. Yeah. You are not your own. Mm -hmm. Glorify God in your spirit and your body which are God's. Now God isn't glorified by burning the body. I understand that there's been people who have died by that means. I understand that. But this has never been the mode of Christian people. The Hindus started this on 650 BC. This has never been the mode. In Scripture it's always burial. God buried Moses. Huh? That's what it says. How about this? Part of the gospel is Christ was buried. Yeah. Now, if that's all I knew about burial, I'd want to be buried. Yeah. Amen. Right. Stephen died, he was buried. John the Baptist, buried. Amen. Burial. Yeah. Why? Because burial is like sowing the body into the earth. Mm -hmm. You bury them in anticipation of the resurrection. Amen. When all that are in the graves mm -hmm. shall hear the voice of the Son of Man and shall come forth, some to the resurrection of damnation, some to the resurrection of life. Jesus is going to shout it out, and the grave is going to lose its victory. Amen. Oh, grave. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just shout at it when I'm leaving. Oh, grave, where's your victory now? Amen. Christ triumphed over the grave. Amen. And when you sow the body into the earth, it's an act of faith. If you're, if you're yes. strong in faith, this is an act of faith. This, yeah. is, this is not the last you're going to see in me. Yeah. I'm coming back. Even Job knew this. Yeah. He didn't have a Bible. Law wasn't given. He's theorized to be a contemporary of Abraham. He said, oh, even though the worms eat my body, yet in my flesh I'll see God. That for myself and not another. I'm going to personally see God after I, after I die. Yeah. See, so he knew. He said he saw a tree that had been cut off. He looked at that tree. He said, well, is there hope for a tree? Cuts off and at the scent of water, it sprouts again. He says, if there's hope for a tree, hey, there's hope for me. We've received a lot more on this subject than, than Job did. Yeah. So I've lived uh, bury three members of my immediate family and my own mother and father. Be a pretty hard thing to do, see, if you don't have this hope of the resurrection. See, actually, technically, only only one third of us is saved right now. Your body's not saved. You know that already. It's going. It's going to be though. It's going to be. <laughs> it's the. It's the. 
purchased possession. That's what it's called. And the redemption of the purchased possession. And your soul it isn't because it can vacillate up and down. Why art thou cast down on my soul? But the part of it is born again, your spirit or your heart has been saved. So you just got the first fruits of salvation. That's all you got. You don't have the whole of it yet. But you're going to have it until you do. Particularly while you're in this body. You must live as a stranger and a pilgrim. I'm not asking you to do this. This is what you got to do. If you're going to survive, you've got to be like Abraham. You've got to say, I'm paying my way through here. I'm not taking any gifts from the world in hopes that it's going to make life easier. I'm looking for that city that hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. Amen. And as that, then what, that, what happens, when you, when you take that posture, you live like that, then the angels, they kick into action. Yep. They're ministers for those who shall be heirs of salvation. Amen. They come alongside. Then the Holy Spirit, he starts interceding from the inside. You don't know what to pray for as you ought. He intercedes for you. And he that searches the mind of the Spirit knows all things. He understands what the Spirit's saying. See, you got Jesus interceding for you in heaven. And God will send you people. Yes. Some of his servants. Amen. He'll send them to you to build you up. But it all is predicated on whether you are a stranger and a pilgrim in the yeah. earth. So I ask you if you are, have these kind of longings, you know, for the mm -hmm. homeland where there's the wicked cease from troubling. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, that's a good kind of place. Amen. I'll close with this, this last thing that I've been tracing all the firsts in Genesis. You remember I told you that Genesis means beginning. So there's a lot of firsts. And just through this chapter, I listed out the first that I've been able to see. You, you may see some others. Yeah, there's 239 of them. 239 firsts. What does that mean? That means the book of Genesis, if you read it right, it'll, it'll shape how you think about yeah. the things that are mentioned first. Death, life, sin, judgment, mm -hmm. faith, grace, no found grace. It, it, it'll shape how you, mm -hmm. how you think about these things. And it, keep, it keeps getting better and better. Genesis is just the beginning. Yeah. Then you get into the Apostles' Doctrine. They're, they're flowering the thing out, see? Mm -hmm. <laughs> as full as it can be and even when they get through they'll say well I've not yet apprehended that for which I've been apprehended I mean I don't count myself to be made perfect we're going to be there's going to come a time now where we'll be we'll know as we are known no more in part but your participation in that and I want to, I want to stress this without being crude <coughs> Your participation in that all depends on the degree to which you're a stranger and a pilgrim in the earth. So uh, work out your own salvation now, fair and terribly. Do it with joy in your heart now. God's given you a lot to do this with. Any of you have a Amen. word? Yes. Yeah, this matter of being a pilgrim and stranger, this is not something that's... That, you know, that you can't know whether or not you're doing this. It, this will actually be a confirmation of the faith you have. Because you, you know whether or not you love the world or, or you love righteousness. You know it. And so just the fact that you he, 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 he makes this point is, is that you can have great confidence now when you serve God because you, you know that you're longing for this city. Mm -hmm. You know that you, you have a love to, to be able to please God and to, to live righteously and holy in this present generation. But, but see, no, nobody else, technically, nobody else knows that, that you're sincere but you. I mean, in your heart, you know that you want to, to do the right thing. I'm saying that because unless you have this kind of confidence, you won't, you won't be able to overcome when you're tempted. You won't be able to stand in the day of uh, temptation. But if you do, so you, can, you can confirm your own faith if you just think about it and see... God's really, He's working in me. I know it because I have a love for the people of God. And I, I, I you see what I'm saying? Yes. This, mm -hmm. this confidence is, um, you don't have to go through life without confidence. Mm -hmm. And this is, um, you can see in Abraham, I was also impressed, again, and edified 
by the faith of Sarah. Yes. That all the way through this account, she she's obedient to, to, to something that, that technically wasn't a direct promise to her. But see, he, I can see Abraham telling her about this because she was involved in it. Yeah. And then when it did, when it when she needed it, the angels they came and they said, "Where's Sarah? Yeah. Why? Because she she needed this yes, revelation. Sir. Yes. But she gets it. And then so what? Within that time frame, she believes. She we know that because in Hebrews yeah. it says she receives strength. strength. Yeah. So but but see, so which, what, how it ministered to me is that you don't have to be the main guy. Now you know it because a lot of people will receive something that you didn't get, but you can benefit from it if you'll just give heed yeah. yes. to to the revelation. You can benefit. Sarah benefited from Abraham's revelation. Yeah, Amen. 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 Sarah did make the statement about this woman's child shall not be the heir with my son. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The Apostle Paul reaches back That's right. to That's his right. letter to Galatians. That's right. He makes this. This point about what saith the scripture? Yeah, yeah. 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 amen. About the woman, amen. The slave woman being the law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Yeah, I, I was thankful for that again. How you um, highlighted that again? That all of these things were purposed by the Lord. Mm -hmm. Everything that yeah. we have in Scripture and that's been revealed to us has been purposely and precisely orchestrated by the Lord mm -hmm. in order to bring about His purpose. Mm -hmm. And so if you can see it that way, then you can receive what He has said yeah. about Amen. His people. Mm -hmm. Amen. He's righteous in all His doings. Yeah. 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 Abraham, technically, all all he was wanting to buy was just the cave. That's right. He got the a sepulcher, but it ended up where he bought the whole field. <laughs> That's right. That's a, another picture of redemption too. Amen. Jesus said, I am not come but to save the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Amen. But actually he, he paid for the sins of the whole world. Amen. He Amen. Us all. Amen. Good. <laughs> yeah, he asked if the cave was at the end of the yeah, field. Right. He got the whole field. <laughs> yes. I, like, I like the whole tone of this. I like the whole setting of this one. Now Sarah and Abraham were up in years yeah. and when she passed away he went and took care of the arrangements. Yeah, yeah. He had uh, set. Well, he, he he had God had provided for him. He was able to take care of that. He was able to to uh, handle the, the financing of it. Uh, it's such a contrast to the way uh, we think about things. Have been taught to think about things today. I don't. I didn't sense in this narrative any stress, anxiety. Yeah. He just mm -hmm. went and took care of the business. Yeah. Today we've got to we've got to make sure that we've got us. A, a plot laid out ahead of time. We got to make sure we've got these funds. You need to be thinking about this time and yeah. be ready. I'm not saying that's all wrong. Yeah. You know, I'm just saying, saying, but I like I, it fits yeah. with Abraham's yeah. faith. You see, Amen. Mm -hmm. it Amen. all fits. Mm -hmm. All right, Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this record of our father Abraham. And we ask for grace. We, we want to appreciate him as you do and see him as you do. We're thankful for his record, which demonstrates how triumphant faith really is. We ask for grace to live by faith and to justify your investment in us. In Jesus' name, amen.